Team Alabama, here is chapter 12 of Stuck in Neutral. Remember that each of the chapters starts with uh, Dad's poem, and so we have chapter 12, Stuck in Neutral. You should be close to getting your 50 facts if you haven't already, and uh, vocab words, 10 vocab words with the definition and 10 questions. So chapter 12. Months break over us. Sean is dead. Only he eats, breathes, and defecates. That means poops. And trapped inside some kind of being that no one will ever understand. This seizure is a doozy. I hear Alice Pons mumbling some questions to Cindy on the TV, but I find it impossible to stick around. Soon I am floating over the roof of our house, soaring up and down, eyeing the landscape. Not really feeling anything you can't feel without your body, but experiencing everything in me and around me as pure joy. I love my mom, brother, sister, dad. Although I can't connect with things through my senses, there is an energy inside me and around me. Somehow all the things that I think about and remember turn to joy, pure joy. Favorite movies, paintings I've seen and loved, music on compact discs, pine cones, chocolate pudding, the taste of smoked oysters. Thank you, Paul. The sound of motors, a bright red 1966 Ford Mustang. I love the idea of books and the dusty smell of them on the bookshelves. The scent of Comet in the stainless steel sink. I think of the way on cool mornings in November that the sun pours in through the window and covers my hand. I think about my baths every night with mom dripping water, warm water from a big soft sponge down my back and the hairbrush passing through my hair after the tangles are all gone, all of it turning to joy. Life can be great, even for me, even for me. I, be, I begin a slow, easy weave around the sky above our house in mom's little garden. I soar, glide, and I know with a certainty beyond all doubt that I am a part of all of this and that I belong here. I don't want to die, I want to live. I want to stay here and I wake up in my body tired. I've never remember the actual moment of my shift back into myself from a seizure. One second, my spirit is out surfing cumulus clouds and on, on or playing with the wind. And the next moment I'm back in my body again, awake, exhausted and real. This time, as I arrive back at my body, I realize that I am still in a wheelchair in my usual spot, but the TV's been turned off. Mom has left the room. Cindy and Paul are talking quietly, seriously. The first words they speak, I can't understand them. It sounds like they are talking with mouths full of sawdust. It's not them, of course. It's just that sometimes it takes me a few mo moments for my senses to come back online after I've been outside myself. Now remember, he had a uh, seizure during the Alice Pons show, so he didn't catch all of that. And so he's kind of fuzzy right now, and he's just kind of coming back into it. But he sees that Cindy and Paul are talking about what happened on the Alice Pons show. And remember, Dad was there, and he was talking with Earl Detro, who killed his son, who had issues, special needs issues also. Finally, I understand Paul saying, he doesn't have the guts, he wouldn't do it. Cindy answers, I know he wouldn't. I don't think it's about courage, though. No, Paul says maybe not, but Detro was willing to give up his whole life for it. Dad's too selfish for that. Besides, if Dad were willing to do that, why would he have waited so long? Cindy pauses a moment. Maybe he needed somebody like Detro to show him the possibility. Paul thinks a moment about it, maybe, he says. He pauses and then speaks again slowly, and he seems to be picking his words carefully. I liked what you said to Alice Pons about Sean, about how hard it is. I realized that Paul is talking about the part, a part of the Alice Pons show that I missed while I had, while in my seizure. Cindy says, I always feel so guilty complaining about it at all. Paul nods in agreement. Yeah, I know. They are both quiet for a moment. I've never heard them talk about me like this before. It doesn't hurt my feelings. I mean, I've always thought that they must feel bad about me sometimes. Still, it surprises me. I wonder how many other times they've had talks like this one. Anyway, Paul says, you were great on the show. The things that you said about how Sean's condition affected us all, how, how it changed us forever, that was a great way to put it. 
Cindy smiles and then speaks in a real stupid nasal type tone. Do you want to kill your brother too? I can tell that Cindy is imitating one of Alice's audience members. Paul bursts out laughing. Wasn't she amazing? You wonder if she spells it B-R-U-V-V-E-R. -V -V -E he pauses and then laughs again. And you asked, which brother? That was classic. Cindy laughs too. You should have seen Alice Pond's face then, I mean off camera. I thought she'd faint. They are quiet for a few moments. And finally, Cindy speaks softly as though wanting to be sure that mom can't hear. So you think dad's all right? You think Sean's safe? Is dad gonna kill Sean? My ears perk up at that one. They are talking about my safety. They're thinking the same things I've been thinking. Yeah, Sean's safe, Paul says. Sure, and definite. Even if dad's gone nuts and wants to do something, he'd have to come through me. Cindy nods. She knows what that means. Actually, we both do. One day last summer, I was out on the front porch sitting in my wheelchair. Paul grounded that day, had missed the chance to meet friends at the Queen Anne Cinema to take in a matinee. Matinee would be a great uh, vocab word. It's a daytime movie. He'd stayed out too late the night before, and his punishment had been house arrest and rock garden weeding. He was not in a good, very good mood. The rock garden starts at the front of the house and goes around the side. It's flat in the front and sloping on the sides. Filled with small plants, pansies, hens and chickens. I don't know all the names. It looks hard to weed, uncomfortable and awkward. Never having weeded myself, I can't say for sure, but the amount of time Paul spends grunting, groaning, swearing, and stopping to stretch his back always makes the job look miserable. Paul worked around the side of the house when two guys, both about his age, 15 or so at that time, walked up the sidewalk to wait for the bus just outside our fence. My head, neck, and eyes were not cooperating at all that afternoon. So I managed only a slight glimpse of the two strangers when they got to the bus stop, and they joked together for a few moments, swearing a lot loud and cocky. One of them said some mean sounding stuff about a girl and the other one laughed. Hey, I heard one of them yell in my direction. You know if this bus has come by or not? His voice sounded nervous, even a little short, as though he felt angry with me. And when I didn't answer, the same voice snapped. Hey, you there, roller derby. He wasn't, he must have met my wheelchair. Has the bus come by or not? His friend laughed and said, I think he's the short, stupid type. No, duh, snarled the one who'd spoken first. Snarled might be another good word to add to your vocab. In the brief glance that I had of them, one looked big and heavy, and he wore a black t-shirt, black jeans, and boots. His friend was shorter, but muscular and tough. His t-shirt, a mesh muscle type shirt that showed off his body. He stood about Paul's height, three or four inches shorter than his big friend, and they both looked rough. Dirty hands, scruffy long hair, a little scary. Hey, Ricky Retardo, where's the bus? Said the other voice. Yeah, the first voice laughed. Retardo Montabon, where's the streetcar named Desire? They both laughed. I'd have laughed too, if I could. I thought their references were pretty witty. But then the first one said, why don't we come up there and slap you around till you show a little respect? He sounded mad and mean. Yeah, said the other voice. If you can give us one good reason why we shouldn't mess you up a little, we'll leave your ugly mm alone. Otherwise, he didn't finish his sentence. My friend laughed again. None of their laughter sounded happy. Although I couldn't see them, I heard them come in through the gate. My spot on the porch was only ten paces from the sidewalk. They were standing right in front of me before I knew it. Hello, Ricky, the first of the voices said. Seen any buses around? What on earth are you, he asked, flipping his finger against my nose. He, looked like some, he looks like some kind of cartoon geek. You're one messed up geek there, bud. A moment later, I felt a warm sensation under my chin. It turned from hot, warm to hot very quickly, and my brainstem started twitching er, me around, and I heard them both laugh. 
don't like the hot stuff. Hey, Mr. Wizard, can you say Bic lighter? That was the last word that voice said. I managed to catch only a glimpse of Paul as he came at them from around the corner. He moved so fast that he was just a blur. Their bodies seemed to explode when he hit them, and I heard a muffled cry from one of the strangers and a huge gasp from the other one. And for the next minute, the world filled with the sound of fists hammering into flesh. Within a matter of seconds, I heard only the whimpering of one of the strangers and complete silence from the other. My head and eyes shifted, focusing over and beyond them, but even my out-of-focus view saw something horrible. The bigger guy did not move at all. He lay just face down in a puddle of blood. It looked like he'd been shot in the face, not Hollywood or TV shot in the face, but really shot. I thought he might be dead. The smaller guy looked even bloodier than the, his friend did. His left nostril left, looked torn open. One of his eyebrows looked half torn off too, and his nose looked flattened. His eyes bloodshot. He was terrified. The worst sight of all was Paul. He looked like a machine pounding away at the guy still standing, turning away from him only long enough to kick and stomp the unconscious guy who lay motionless on the ground. I'd never seen such an expression on Paul's face before. The veins in his neck looked ready to pop. His fists already dirty from the weeding were covered with blood. He looked like a monster barely recognizable. In another few moments, the shorter guy fell to the ground, curling into a ball and whimpering to his unconscious friend. Paul ran to the side of the house, leaving them there at, the, at my feet. I could hear the smaller one muttering, Adam, wake up, Adam, please, oh God. In only a few seconds, Paul came back. You like fire, huh? He muttered so low and cold that it scared me. You're going to walk up to my brother and burn him? You think you're going to do that? He kicked each of them hard. Burn my brother? It wasn't until then that I saw the gasoline can that Paul had brought back with him. He lifted it up, quickly unscrewed the lid, and poured the contents onto them. The fumes almost knocked me out. Waves of gas shimmered up from their backs. You're going to burn my brother and laugh? Paul said as he finished emptying the can. He reached down and grabbed the arm of the smaller stranger. The guy began to whimper and tried to hide his hand under himself. But Paul jerked his arm out and then he bent his fingers back until I heard a sickening crack. The Bic lighter fell to the ground and Paul picked it up. You like fire, huh? Paul asked. The guy who could still talk pleaded, please don't, please, oh God, please. Paul grabbed the back of the guy's vest shirt and he wadded it up and jerking it close to his other hand, the guy's body looked like a rag doll. The whole world smelled of gasoline. Paul held the lighter against the gas-soaked wad of garment and he flicked the bit. It didn't spark. His thumb went back to the little lever to press it once again, and I heard a scream from behind me. Paul! Cindy flew off the porch and pushed Paul, who fell back onto his butt. He was up instantly, grabbing Cindy by her shirt front. He pulled back his fist to hit her, but she screamed again. Paul! Paul! Stop it! Stop! Something seemed to snap in Paul. He blinked, his eyes hard, and stared at Cindy for what seemed like minutes, really only a few seconds. Okay, Paul mumbled, his voice shaky, even a little frightened. He patted Cindy's arm. Okay, okay. Cindy looked down at the strangers. The big one sat up now, too, both of them terrified. Soaked in gas, one big misfire from death, and they sat frozen, staring down at the ground. Cindy said, what's going on here? She sounded just like mom. Paul's lower lip began to quiver. Quiver is a great vocab word, meaning kind of shake. As he spoke to Cindy, they were going to hurt Sean. They were going to burn him. Cindy looked at them again and said angrily, you better hurry up and get out of here. If I let my brother go, he'll kill you. Without a word, the two strangers managed to help each other up and scurried out our open gate. In 10 seconds, they were gone. We never saw them again. I never loved and feared Paul more than in that moment. 
Yes, Cindy knows what Paul means when he says that dad would have to come through him to hurt me. Cindy understands, so do I. Yet each of us knows too that Paul can't really protect me forever. The fact is, if dad decides that Earl Detro is right, no one can protect me. That's the end of chapter 12. Make sure you're finishing up your uh, 50 facts. Make sure you're finishing up your autobiography. All of those are submitted to me in a Google Doc. Anything that you send to me comes in a Google Doc, if you would. That's awesome. Have a great rest of your day, Team Alabama.